Okay, so a uh, little bit about politics, what's going on in that area after World War II in the 1940s. Uh, this is entitled The Buck Stops Here, which was Truman's famous saying. Now, politically, uh, after World War II, uh, the Cold War very much led the nation's priorities. Um, everything was directed around foreign policy, national security. Anti-communism strengthened the case of conservatism, and there were fissures in the Democratic Party. Uh, while Dewey would remain the strong conservative candidate, which we'll get to the election of 1948 shortly. Now, with regard to labor, um, there had been some issues after the war. Truman had averted a strike in early 1946 by seizing mines and uh, promising a settlement. An agreement would be reached with labor leader John L. Lewis. Lewis, though, would renege on the deal in October of 46, right before the midterm elections. So this, of course, hurts Truman, hurts the Democrats, because the conundrum, the Democrats were cozy with organized labor, especially after the New Deal. Of course, remember, New Deal coalition, labor is a key part of that voting coalition. Democrats needed labor on their side for elections. But Truman did not want to look soft. So he had Attorney General Tom Clark charge Lewis with violating the smith Connolly Act, which banned strikes against government-held plants. Now, this was supposed to be a wartime measure, but he adapted it for post-war, uh, again, so that he could kind of play that middle ground. Lewis would be found guilty of contempt. He was fined, and the union itself was fined $250,000 for every day that it stayed out. Lewis himself would try to contact Truman in the White House uh, to try to make a deal. Truman would have none of it. Quote, the White House is open to anybody with legitimate business, but not that son of a bitch. <laughs> Classic Truman. The 1946 uh, midterms would indeed come back to haunt the Democrats. The Republicans would take the House and the Senate and a majority of governorships. Truman would be ridiculed by many, um, and he becomes a national joke. One of the famous ones was, to air is Truman. At this point, he only had a 32% approval rating. Democrats, also worried about Truman, would try to recruit Eisenhower to run as a Democrat, and they discussed this with him right up until the beginning of the convention in 48. Republicans continued to attack New Deal initiatives. The Taft-Hartley Act has passed this outlaw the closed shop. It made unions liable for breach of contract, and it prohibited union contributions to election funds. It required union financial reports and stipulated that union leaders had to take non-communist loyalty oaths. So this is, again, a Republican act. Uh, Truman vetoes the act, but the Republican Congress overrode his veto. They got the act passed. Truman looks like a hero, and labor once again gets behind Harry S., which leads us to the 1948 election. Ooh, this was a doozy. 20 years later, we'll have an important convention in Chicago. This Democratic National Convention is held in Philadelphia. As mentioned, there are divisions within the Democratic Party, um, liberal, moderate, and somewhat conservative. The popular front, which was the more progressive side of this, the more liberal side, was rather sympathetic to socialist ideas and called for greater government action and increased reforms. Remember our old friend Henry Wallace, who had the soft approach to Cold War? Um, he was fired as Secretary of Commerce by Truman because of a speech he gave in which he declared the U.S. should stay out of Eastern Europe, that it was no more their business than Latin America was Russia's. So Truman fires Wallace. Um, and Wallace would become the, well, he is favored by the popular front, by the progressive wing of the party. Truman and the rest represent a more middling group of Democrats. The vital center is what it is called. Southern Democrats try to hold on to the past. Um, there is an argument over the Democratic Party platform. Now, as far as Southern Democrats go, think back to the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln was a Republican. So many Southerners would be solidly Democrat uh, going forward. And indeed, they kind of help, well, further divide the Democratic Party because they are kind of on the outs. But we'll get to that here in a minute. So again, there is an argument over the Democratic Party platform. You have the progressives, you have the moderates, and you have the conservative wing. Um, the conundrum, African-Americans, again, going back to the New Deal coalition, 
provide an important part of the Democratic constituency, but so did Southern whites. Previously, Democrats had only really given lip service to civil rights and the party platform, but the new ADA, uh, the Americans for Democratic Action, which was led by Reinhold Niebuhr, who I've wanted to get to in class, we won't have time to, but the ADA called on Truman and the Democratic Party to specifically call for new legislation to deal with civil rights. They called for four specific points, an abolition of poll taxes in federal elections, anti-lynching legislation, a permanent fair employment practices committee, and desegregation of the armed forces. Now, this was a hotly contested issue. Uh, <clears throat> at the 48 convention, Hubert Humphrey was then the mayor of Minneapolis. He was a candidate for Senate, and of course, he will serve later as Johnson's vice president and run for president, unfortunately for him, in 1968 as a Democrat. He gave an emotional speech on the floor, which culminated with what would be his most famous quote. Quote, the time has now arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. Whoo, powerful stuff. Um, really garnered a lot of attention, a lot of support. This was really the high point of Humphrey's political career. Uh, if you get a chance to find that video, I guess I can look for it too and try to share it. I haven't seen it, but I've read this speech numerous times, and it is, again, very powerful. Liberals, because, partially because of his speech, would win a close vote regarding the party platform. What would happen? The entire Mississippi delegation and most of the Alabama contingent walked out of the convention. Other southern states refused to support Truman, and they would put forth their own candidate, Richard Russell of Georgia. Now, we're going to get to... Uh, Russell doesn't stick around. We're going to get to that. Two weeks after the convention... Truman would issue his executive order mandating equal opportunity in the armed forces and in federal civil service. We're going to get to his work on civil rights here shortly. Outraged Southern secessionists uh, because of this, and they would nominate Strom Thurmond as a presidential candidate for their states' rights party, the Dixiecrats. This is 1948. Thurmond would be around into the 21st century as a Democrat. Uh, the 1948 presidential election then served as a landmark in American politics, a representation of a changing tide of identity politics and the political parties associated with different groups. Up through the 1960s, the South voted Democrat, the Solid South. This would begin to change in 1948 with the Dixiecrat Revolt and Truman's stand for civil rights on the Democratic Party platform. This sea change would mark a new wave for the Democratic Party. Um, that really lasts through today. Initially, we see some change with the New Deal coalition put forth by FDR for the New Deal with this. But again, you have uh, quite a divided party. So in 1948, you have four legitimate candidates for president. They're all on the ballot. Henry Wallace, uh, well, I shouldn't say they're all on the ballot everywhere. Dixiecrats aren't. But Henry Wallace's Progressive Party, which contained the Popular Front. Strom Thurmond's Dixiecrats. Thomas Dewey's Republicans, and of course, Harry S. Truman's Democrats. Truman versus Dewey. Dewey was the popular New York governor who had made many positive reforms. He was no slouch. He was a gang-busting special prosecutor and district attorney. He had been governor of New York for six years, during which time he had cleared the slums, extended clinics and hospitals, cleaned up mental institutions, outlawed racial discrimination in the workplace, added to the state's infrastructure, and cut state tax rates by 50%. Also, what was important, he was virently anti-communist. So, Dewey is a Republican, but he really, you can see, kind of transcends just what we can consider modern conservatism. I mean, he was very active with reforms. Of course, he was highly favored, which we'll get to. Truman's folksy style uh, won many people over. He made further inroads by beginning to take questions off the cuff. Now, one can only imagine current candidates doing that, modern candidates. Um, of course, they love their teleprompters. But this begins what was called the Whistle Stop Tour. This would bring out many people. Uh, and one of his famous quotes, which emanates from this, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. During this Whistle Stop Tour, he would make Republican Congress a scapegoat. He called them into session in the summer, and they tore down and denied his proposal. So he called them do-nothings. People started to yell, give them hell, Harry, to which he replied, I never give anybody hell. I just tell the truth, and they think it's hell. There's a quote you can use at home. Um, and, of course, we get to the famous Dewey Defeats Truman headline. Uh, everybody's seen this image, Truman holding up the paper that says Dewey Defeats Truman. Um, 
a handful of reasons for this. Uh, first and foremost, again, many people consider Dewey kind of a shoe in uh, Truman and the Democrats had their own issues. Think about the fact that there are three presidential candidates from the Democratic Party alone. Dewey's very popular. He's from a, a big state, New York, a lot of people. New York governors, of course, have been president before. Think Theodore Roosevelt. Um, so there are a lot of uh, reasons why people think that Dewey defeats would defeat Truman and rather handily. Also, we have not good polling. There were some outdated method. I know this sounds familiar, right? There are some outdated methods to garner votes. Newsweek magazine predicted a landslide for Dewey. Why? Because they had interviewed 50 leading political writers and none of them voted for Truman. Truman's response to this, I know every one of those 50 fellows and there isn't one of them who has enough sense to pound Saiyan in a rat hole. Truman would take 303 electoral votes, Dewey only 189, Thurman would take 39. Now imagine if the Dixiecrats had really attempted to get the nation behind him. He was only on the ballot in 16 states. He took four of them. Kind of interesting. But again, Truman basically uh, whoops Dewey in this election, even though we're all kind of, you know, led to believe this was super close. But as far as some um, historiography, uh, Hamby, for example, uh, argues that Truman transformed New Deal liberalism into a more moderate Cold War liberalism. He adapted to the new international and domestic realities of the post-war world. During the 1930s, there was a move to the left. Many liberals questioned whether capitalism could provide for the nation. World War II pro proved otherwise, as the war demonstrated the potential of American industry and a new, more centered liberal mission focused on realizing capitalism's capacity for endless growth. Now, um, the ADA, as far as some of these other groups, the Americans for Democratic Action, they sought to isolate communists and pro-communists from mainstream, uh, from the mainstream of liberal politics. Again, they're a more progressive group. Progressives were also increasingly critical of Soviet communism after the Berlin airlift, uh, after the Russian denial of the Marshall Plan, and of course, after the coup in Czechoslovakia. We'll get to that, but again, what this shows... The reason I mention this is because the ADA and the progressives are, again, very left-leaning within the Democratic Party, but even they come to the center. There is some realization. Now, of course, during the 40s, there are uh, some newspaper articles in the New York Times which talk about how great Stalin is, how awesome his five-year plan is, how it's working. The naivete of these writers, of course, is quite unfortunate because Stalin was forcing uh tens of millions of people into starvation. And again, there's some, began to see some recognition of this, and even the most liberal people recognize Stalin's a totalitarian. And that communism, well, we'll get to that. As far as getting back to uh, the center, we mentioned the Hamby work. I would also mention Arthur Schlesinger Jr., a noted historian um, influenced by Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr sorry. His work was uh, called The Vital Center. This is a book I think would be excellent to use in this class. Uh, because of the belief in the integrity of the individual, the limited state, in the due process of law, and in empiricism and gradualism, we see this move to the center. There is a mixed economy. Sure, there is some planning. There are some welfare programs. There is antitrust legislation to discipline big business. Um, there is an idealization of some New Deal programs as, of a, as a part of a mixed economic bag. But again, recognizing the importance of business, but also government's role in working with business. Schlesinger argues Truman's ideas were in tune with this vital center. For example, his anti-inflation measures, his progressive tax structure, his repeal of the Taft-Hartley Act, um, his veto of the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, his work for higher minimum wage, for resource development and public power programs, for expansion of Social Security, national medical insurance, this was an idea of Truman's as well, federal aid for education, extensive housing legislation, and civil rights bills. Truman did seek more government involvement in industry, uh, for example, at the construction of plants. Um, quote, between the reactionaries of the extreme left with their talk about revolution and class warfare and the reactionaries of the extreme right with their hysterical cries of bankruptcy and despair lies the way of progress. It's Truman. Uh, so again, Schlesinger really uh, emphasizes Truman's work in the middle and Throughout American history, most Americans, 
including today, are in the middle. They're moderate. They're not extreme right. They're not extreme left. Um, they accept a little bit of, uh, of both liberalism and conservatism, again, most. Uh, and Truman tapped into this. And Schlesinger points this out. This is especially prescient after World War II when you have Cold War thought. Liberals couldn't just eschew the Cold War completely. Again, credibility is very important. So Truman maintains uh, his Cold Warrior status uh, while at the same time being a little bit more active uh, with the government. His fair deal uh, in many ways was an expansion of Roosevelt's New Deal, an attempt to adapt the New Deal tradition to post-war prosperity, again, with a focus on abundance rather than scarcity. Why did Truman do this? A few reasons. Uh, some argue that he wanted to demonstrate he was a legitimate president in the shadow of FDR. He wanted to provide more opportunity to those who seem marginalized. Um, there were economic and social undertones to this. And again, this is important to Truman. He wants to provide for people who are without. Uh, and there are some connections you can see between Truman's thought and Johnson's thought later on. The specific planks of this program, civil rights, again, was a key, and economic inequality, which he wanted to solve. There was some success. We have the establishment of a new minimum wage, Social Security has expanded, public power. The Housing Act passed but failed due to weak administration, poor financing, and local opposition. This did not help the poor as much as Truman thought it would, but again, the fact it was passed, uh, pragmatists would look at this as attempt, a trial, and then you kind of change that. There is a failure, though. Um, he was unable to repeal Taft-Hartley. Civil rights legislation was still quite minimal. Um, there is not as much aid to education as he thought. National medical insurance failed. Of course, what, five, six decades later, that'll come back. The Brannon plan, uh, price supports for agriculture, failed. Um, there's not a large amount of interest in major reforms from people or Congress at this time. Um, there's also, and part of the, obviously, it's pretty obvious, you've got the Depression in the 30s, you've got World War II in the first half of the 40s. People want to move on. They had a lot of uh, reforms, et cetera, legislation in the 30s. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. First half of the, of the next decade, people are restricted because of the war. There's rationing. People make money, but they can't spend it. Um, many people, of course, aren't around to spend it. So there are a lot of restrictions on people. After the war, they want to move on. They don't want these restrictions. So that's one reason you do not have a large amount of interest in reform from the people or Congress. There's also a focus on anti-communism, um, and this really is more important than domestic change for many. The bigger issue, of course, is fighting and stopping communism. Post-war prosperity, further limited, limited aspiration toward real change in the domestic world. Again, hey, things are great. Why do we need to worry about it? And... When we get to next week and we get to the 50s, the Korean War also would begin to usurp some of the momentum toward domestic social policy. Now, a few things regarding Truman on civil rights. Um, some are not familiar with how active he was. Again, the fair deal. Uh, a substantial part of the, of the fair deal was about procuring civil rights for establishing more equality. Uh, he also established a committee regarding uh, lynching and anti-lynching legislation, which he wanted to promote. He called for this anti-lynching legislation, and he called for an anti-poll tax law, uh, which again follows some of what the ADA had mentioned. He also issued two major executive orders, which I had briefly mentioned earlier. He banned discrimination in federal hiring, and he ended racial segregation in the armed forces. So Truman, again, very much in the center. Um, but we see attempts to make significant change. Part of this is timing. He's not going to do much of this after World War II, especially with the Republican Congress. But he makes his attempts. Now, we're going to stop with the 40s right here. Next week, we'll get to the 50s. And we'll kick off with, of course, the Korean War. Have a good weekend.